POSB parents. Thanks for joining us today. Um, today is the third episode of the ABCs of home-based learning. What we're going to tackle now is to make sure that your child is learning without supervision. So it's all about independent learning now. Um, as you know, uh, the circuit breaker has been extended to 1st of June, which means that we are going to have to go through this home-based everything for a, a little bit longer, okay, for everyone's safety and all. Now, um, I'm sure after a few weeks of going through the motions on your own, you're finding out that maybe um, there needs to be a little bit more of improvement of how you manage the time around the house. And that means that you might have to let go of some of the hours you spend with your child and trust that they will learn on their own. But how do you make sure that they are learning and how do you make sure that they're ready for independent learning, right? So today, um, to help us through that, we have Ms. Aileen Chu. She is the co-founder of Practical, and she's an ex-primary school teacher. So, hello, Eileen. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Pam. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so I'm Eileen. I'm the co-founder of Practical, an AI math practice platform. So, previously, I was a primary school teacher uh, for almost about 10 years. Wow. I, I teach kids from as young as P1 all the way to P6. So I'm very happy to be here today to be able to share some of my thoughts and uh, experience with all of you. Yep. Thank you so much. I, I know you're very busy right now. Um, I, despite the fact that we're all working from home, somehow we're like, we find that it's very, like, it's more busy now than it was like during the regular yeah, hours. But, but it's, it's, it's crazy for everyone. <laughs> I know. Now that, um, so everyone's like doing the home-based learning, right? And this was really like a surprise for parents. Any thoughts on like, on like, um, like the learning curve, because there are, there is going to be like a learning curve for parents and also for kids, right? When they adjust to this, like any thoughts on that? Okay, so for this period, to be honest, right, I think it's really crazy for like parents, teachers, and even the children as well, because of this whole sudden situation that we are in. Now, for parents, they have to do like they will have to work from home as well as on top of that, they have to manage their kids, they have to make sure that they are learning and spending their time meaningfully. Then for the kids themselves. They are not. They are suddenly trashed. Uh, they are, they suddenly find themselves at, at home, which is kind of uh, strange to them because they are expected to learn at home instead of the usual like playing at home. Yeah. So it yes, definitely it would be good if the kids are able to learn independently right now, so that parents can actually free up some time and make this whole experience a little bit less stressful. Yeah, wow, pleasant. That's true. How how do you how do you think parents like should should start letting kids like learn independently? Like, is there is there a way to start? Are are there certain things that parents need to do in order to get their child ready for like independent learning? Yeah, I think that when we talk about independent learning, right? I'll think of it. I'll talk about this in three parts. So first of all, right, parents really have to consider whether your children, uh, they have the ability to handle the tech involved. So right now. With home-based learning, I believe that a lot of kids, they are expected to uh, log into different platforms. So they are expected to take photos, uh, scan their homework for their teachers. It won't be such a big issue for the primary, the upper primary kids, maybe the five and sixes. They but, know better, right? Yeah, correct. But then for the primary one to four, perhaps because of their limited exposure to using computer for work, yeah. they might need more support coming from the parents. So now the parents, uh, Besides being parents themselves, right, they have to be tech support to their kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah, then the second thing that they need to think about when we talk about independent learning is whether the kids uh, actually know what to do when they get stuck. Because many a times, right, parents might find that, okay, today I set you this piece of, uh, you're supposed to do this work in this uh, time frame. But then when you go in to check on them, you realize that, eh, why, why is my kid playing? Or why are, are you just sitting there doing nothing? And then it's very, um, it can be quite exasperating for the parents because they, the, when they ask the kids, right, most likely the kid will tell them, oh, because I don't know how to do. Yeah, it's, a, it's really a very common yeah, Indian yeah. Uh, answer for kids. Yeah, so uh, I guess if, with this respect, right, if let's say um, the parents really find their kids in this situation, what the parents can do is to teach the kid how to proceed if you uh, bump into a problem. Yeah. So for example, parents can actually share with them like, oh, okay, so if you don't know how to do these questions, you have to tell them explicitly, especially the P1s and 2, right, that uh, you can always skip this question and then move on to the next. 
Yeah, it doesn't mean that you don't know one, then you, it, it, it means ends there. everything. <laughs> yeah. mm. Then, uh, also, then the last part, right, of course, if let's say the kids, they have the technical know how, they know what to do when they're stuck, but then they have to be motivated enough to do their work as well. Yeah, so just now earlier on, I mentioned that a lot of kids, they have the idea that school is for work and their home is for play. Right. So, because of the situation that we are in, I believe that parents also need to communicate with the kids and explain to them that now uh, you, you have to do your, what you are doing in school, at home. But then, of course, after doing all these things, right, the, the, at the end of the day, a home is still a place for you to relax and bond with your family members. Yeah. So if, let's say, uh, for kids who need a little bit more motivation, you can also encourage them and... Uh, for kids who are really easily distracted, uh, what you can do is to put them in a more conducive environment. So don't put them in a like living room with a TV right in front of them or like some and toys inside them. Yeah. Mm, and for the older kids, I think it's very important to get them to put their handphones away. Otherwise, they might be distracted with WhatsApp from their friends. Yeah. That's true. But how, okay, okay. now I'm hearing like, okay, so that's mm. some form of like responsibility and discipline, right? Mm-hmm. How do you instill that? Um, especially with young children, hmm. now that the, the their space for relaxation, sleep, rest, play, and study is like all mixed up into one, right? How do you then make them like res- responsible for their time? How do you instill that discipline that okay, this time is for study, this time is for this? Okay, for time management, right? I think um, little kids don't really have the concept of time, so what they don't really know like when you should be doing what. So one way to do it would be for parents to come up with a, a visual timetable to just tell the kids like not so much on like maybe from 10 to 10 to be what you're supposed to do, but rather to sequence the events that should happen so that the kids have a better idea like, okay, so now I have to do English and then math and then I have a break and then what happens after that? Yeah. So it's so, like a schedule not break, broken down into time. More of like, okay, this is the first thing you're going to do. This is the second thing you're going to do. Right. So actually the emphasis is more of the sequencing of event. So the kids know what they're supposed to do after this activity is done. Mm. Yeah. And then of course, um, Sorry. This, <laughs> okay, so of course teaching this uh, is good. You can always adapt and improve, improve along the way. But sometimes uh, one, one challenge that some of the parents might face is whether my kids will actually follow through it. Yeah. yeah. So when that happens, right, some kids, uh, if let's say they need a little bit more push or motivation, what parents can do is to try to add in a little bit of uh, an element of gamification. So like what we do at Practical, right, we have this very interesting thing whereby we have daily quests where kids will actually come in to do um, a few questions every day and then we use little rewards to encourage them. So for parents, what how you can translate this to your home is perhaps to actually use uh, little stickers. So like let's say today I have this schedule all drawn up. So uh, when you when you're done with a task, uh, you can actually track the task by like placing uh, stickers one by one. And then for the kids, right, it's e- much easier to track their own progress as well. Yeah. So it's uh, it's uh, giving them like the opportunity to track their own progress. Mm-hmm. And also feel like that sense of accomplishment when they finish something. Right? Ah, yeah, 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 correct. <laughs> That's very smart. Okay, now, with the whole time management, right? Because, again, we have very limited hours in the day. And for some reason now, like, the days feel shorter, but they feel, like, more um, plugged in with, like, all these activities that you have to do, that the kids have to do. How how do you get the kids to, like, to, to, to work smarter? Because there's a certain flow of how um, activities that generally go, right? But... Sometimes the, um, that's not like the smartest way to go about it. So how do you get them to like, not just work hard, but like work smart? Okay, so for this, uh, earlier on I mentioned about kids not having the a very good grasp of time. Time. So when we talk about like efficiency or productivity, right, it's more of an adult term. So what we can help kids to, to become more productive is to actually help them to set, okay, we can help them by setting time limits. So for example, right, we tell them, okay, for during this half an hour, you have to do your work quickly. And then once you are done, then you can go and play. Yeah. So of course, when we say that, right, some kids, um, it's, some kids tend to rush through their work and then they tell you like, oh, mom, I'm done. So can I go and play now? So we also have to ensure that when we communicate this idea to the kids, we have to tell them that, okay, besides finishing your work, yeah. you also have to make sure that uh, 
you have done your best, that means I must be able to see effort or um, your answers must be accurate. So all these uh, requirements, right, it really depends on what the parents are, um, that what the parents want for the child. So for example, let's say I have a really messy child. So your simple requirement would be like, maybe, oh, then what I want you to do is to finish up this piece of work and then I want to see that really neat handwriting. Or you can also say things like, um, okay, so within this time frame, you must finish this uh, number of questions or you have to get uh, how many of them correct. So in event that, let's say the kid doesn't do it, right? As parents, I think it's very important to make sure that the consequences get carried over to the next day. So like, I was gonna ask, mm, yeah, yeah, I was going to ask, like, how do you, okay, because you're, you're giving them these tasks, right? And they get rewards, um, as they reach like certain milestones or certain levels like how if because if they're rushing through it right how do you show them that okay you know like every every action you do has like a consequence so mm -hmm. they, then they have to like start to analyze like um you know like the power of choice and consequence right ah. is now a good time to like um mm -hmm. inject that knowledge or like introduce that idea to kids mm. so i think yeah you brought a very important point and i think that um there's this there's this principle of equivalent trait that has to be taught to the kids. Sorry, um, it's equivalent trait. Yes, equivalent trait. So okay. uh, it can be taught to kids as young as like P1 or even earlier if you're younger kids. So the idea behind it is that you want the kids to know that for everything that they want in life, they need to put in the same amount of effort. And this is really a very powerful thing. So for example, if today you your kid says that they want to play, right? So they want to play for one hour, then you have to tell them, oh, okay, so if you have to play for one hour, I think it's only fair that you have to do work for one hour as well. Yeah, so the ratio can be adjusted according to, uh, depending on the, the parents' understanding of their kids. Uh. Yeah, so over time, what the, this actually shapes the kids' thinking into no matter what they do, right, effort is, putting in the effort is very important. Yeah. And normally, right, when kids mm. put in the effort and they fail, Ah. It's, they'll feel dejected, right? So, right. And, and then parents also, I, I'm sure, like, it's either they'll be like, oh, no, don't worry, you can do it again. Mm. Simple words. But how do you, like, are the, is there a certain way that parents can maybe help encourage them to, kids to be resilient and try again and not feel so, like, you know, like, not feel like that failure is really the end of it all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's very important. Um, okay, the message that the kid, uh, sorry, the message that the parents are sending to the kids is actually very important. Just as like when as teachers, right, when we communicate to the kids, we shouldn't take um the anger whereby if you if some if you have not done achieved this, then this is bad, or, or something must be done. But rather, we have to take a more um we have to come from a more encouraging anger. So we recognize the kids for whatever effort that they have put in. So it can, so let's say today your kid has already, you can see that they are putting in a lot of effort, but they just didn't get it right. Then you just have to point them to the right direction. Yeah, so that the kids will always have this positive association with trying. And it doesn't really matter if you don't, um, you don't get it right, you get the correct feedback, and then you work upon it. Yeah, I think that's something that will go a long way in the child's life also. Definitely, because I feel more often than not, right, it's not like what you were saying earlier, it's about motivation for the child. But mm -hmm. more often than not, like when they do try, they are going to experience like setbacks. They are going to have like little failures along the way. And um, the challenge really is how to teach them how to be like, you know what, failing is okay. Yeah, and right. then like encouraging them to try again. Yeah, and yeah. So like, that's probably one it's... element. No, 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 no. I was just saying like, that's like one element I feel like we're, we're, we're missing because mm. everyone's like really focused on like results, results, results. And, mm. you know, come on, let's face it. Like not everything, uh, mm -hmm. not everything you do is going to be like a successful endeavor and things like that. So just teaching how, teaching kids how to be resilient and keeping, um, keeping at it, you know, like continuing the work, mm. I feel like will really pay off later on. But another very interesting um, idea, right, that, that came about because since, everyone's now like working from home, studying from home and everything like that. Everyone's like operating in very close quarters. So parents, I feel, have to be more um, aware of what they're saying, what they're doing, because these are going to be like model behavior for their children. So mm -hmm. how, how can, like, I mean, like, what can parents do to lead like a better example for children when it comes to independent or uh, independent learning or like unsupervised learning? 
uh, I guess when it comes to doing work, what parents can do is to model that behavior at home because anyway, they are working from home, right? So when the yeah. kids see them um, being very focused people at their work, then they'll feel a bit like, okay, so this is how I should look like when I'm working. <laughs> Instead of walking around or being distracted. Mm. Yeah. In terms of like equivalent trait, actually, just now when I mentioned that, right, yeah. parents can also model that. So for example, let's say uh, today I want to watch TV, then you can tell the kids, oh, that's why I have to do some chores before I go and watch TV. So similarly, you have to do something before you can get what you want. Yeah. So, okay, because parents would have their own schedule. Like um, personally, like I would wake up, have my breakfast, you know, get ready for work and then I'd leave for work. So I, I mean, this is something I try to emulate, like still keep up with while I'm working from home. Um, do you do you suggest that maybe parents, would you suggest that maybe parents can somehow include their children in that schedule? So ah. that it's like a thing that the whole family will go through? Mm, so this will really depend on the parents' work schedule. So uh, let's, okay, so if let's say your kid needs to work from home, I'm sure there are certain work that, um, okay, it also depends on your kids. So just let me share this little example with you. So if let's say your kids are the type that uh, are, they, okay, they are quite, they are okay doing work on their own. So one good idea would to place them in the same room as you. Because okay. uh, as my experience as a teacher, right, I had, um, I had occasions where by after school, I would actually study with the kids. So what I do is we sit at the same table. I'll tell the kids, okay, so um, now it's time for you to do your homework while I do my marking. And then after Is that, that right, a distraction for you and them? Uh, not really if you set the right rules from the start. So initially, right, the kids will be very tempted to talk to you because they enjoy talking. <laughs> yeah, so you have to tell them like, okay, we can talk. But the focus now is for both of us to do our work. So you can set like maybe, depending on the comfort level, sometimes it's like half an hour, sometimes it's one hour. And then after we're done with our work, then we can start talking and then uh, perhaps just share about some thoughts. Uh, yeah. mm. So setting rules at the start would help then? Yes, a lot. But of course, there are classroom rules, so they're like, there should be some sort of like home study rule. Ah, yeah, you're right. So, but if let's say your kid is the more talkative type, which yeah. I've experienced myself. So for such kids, right, I think uh, it would be a little bit trickier because you just need to uh, remind them. But of course, if let's say the parent is working from home and you need to be in a meeting, then I think it'd be better if your kid is in their study room. Yeah, in this case, you're in a separate area. Yeah. Mm. Okay, now one big thing when it comes to um, independent learning, I guess, for parents is that it, it's a little difficult for us to understand and actually do the letting go part, right? So, because as parents, and I'm sure as teachers also, like you always feel that need to like uh, rush in and help. Your, mm -hmm. your, your kids, you see that they're struggling a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a natural instinct, I feel like, for, for, for both parents and teachers. So how do you, like, what advice would you give to parents, right, um, for when, when they actually have to let go and let their child be and, like, do things on their own? Okay, I think as loving parents, right, it's very natural for you when you see your kid uh, needing help and then you just jump in to give them a hand. But sometimes I feel that uh, a little struggle is actually necessary for the kids. So I always like to share this story with my parents. Uh, it's the butterfly story. So for example, right, when you look at the butterfly, just before it turns into a butterfly, when it's at the cocoon stage, it tends to struggle. And then yeah. this struggle, right, it actually helps the butterfly to develop their wings so that they're able to fly later on. So similarly for the kids, right, I think that sometimes we, when they bump into obstacles, we really need to let them tough it up in order yeah. for them to grow. And as they struggle, they actually learn to become more independent in the long run. And so on the parent side or, or the teacher side, you really have to control yourself and try yeah, to back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but mm. okay, because admittedly, right, and when you see your child struggling, it's it's faster, or like it's faster mm. to like just give them the answer, to just help out and like do it for them. Right? Yeah. Are there any drawbacks to just like stepping in and doing it for them? Um, okay, the, the thing is, if let's, let's think of it this way. So the more you help them now, the more you need to help them in future. But the lesser you help them now, 
in future when they're more independent, you don't need to help them as much. Hey, that's true. I, I guess that's true. Because now I, I feel like uh, me, me, I guess like as a parent, right? Mm. Um, just like it's just like faster for me to if I I'm, if I'm gonna do it, right? Like no, I'm just gonna do it. It's gonna take two minutes, as opposed to me sitting down with my kid and explaining like, oh no, maybe you do this or why don't you try this? It's like mm. it's gonna be like an hour's activity, as opposed to me taking five minutes to do it, right? I feel like that's the mm. that's what parents are probably thinking when it comes to like, should I just should I just let him do it or should I explain? Right, so the from the parents' point of view, you really have to think about it uh, in the long run. Because a lot of parents, right, some, after some time, they might actually come and share with you, like, oh, why is my pet, why, why is my kid always asking me about their homework? Or like, why is my why 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 is my kid always asking me to help help them do things? Yeah. So you don't want to encourage that type of dependency. You want the kids to know that um for every every problem that they face. They have to put in the effort to try to solve it on their own. And then if they don't know how to solve it, right, and they come to you, I think for the parents' part, if you want to help, right, a good way of helping would be to point them in the right direction or provide the scaffolding. So you want to guide them to use more their problem-solving skills. So for example, if let's say um, today my kid comes to me with a piece of English homework and then they are not able to do it because they don't understand the meaning of this word. So what can you do? So instead of just telling the kid the meaning, which you can take do it like in one one or two seconds, you can actually point the kid to, oh, do you know that you can actually use a dictionary to help you out? So go ahead. You let the kid try to use that tool and find the answer, and then you can verify and guide your child towards uh, that how to do it. So that the next time, right, let's say they bump into a word that they don't recognize, they'll immediately know that, oh, I don't have to ask mom. I can just straight away go to a dictionary and I can get help. Especially yeah. now that dictionaries are like online. Like most of the information you find is online. And come on, let's admit it. The kids are very tech savvy. Like mm. maybe you're right. Just pointing into the right direction will make them more like independent and like able to resolve things on their own. Um, but Correct. okay. I, Sorry. Oh. Yeah, so, so I feel that um, pointing the kids to the right direction is one thing. But eventually there will be a Sometimes, okay, sometimes there will be a point whereby the parents really have to step in. Yeah. So for parents, right, when is that point? It's really up. They, they need to use their own judgment. So if let's say today I've seen that uh, my kid has tried uh, solving the problem on their own for long enough, and then suddenly there will be a point in time where they are just about to give up. Yeah. So at that point in time, you have to recognize that just before they give up, all right, it's the point that you have to step in to help. Because if they so pass, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this, this. Um, you need some experience with this, uh. Yeah. So because if let's say the kid actually pass the point whereby they give up, right, and then you step in, the whole learning outcome would be a very different thing. Yeah. That I I can understand because, but then again, parents would be the ones to know their kids best, right? So they, I mean, I, I I'm assuming because with my son, like I'm assuming it's easier to identify these like moments they, they, the, when they're on the breaking point, I guess I would say. Sometimes you can see by like verbal uh, visual cues, right? Sometimes you, you can see them being very frustrated or they keep frowning or they are about to throw a tantrum because you know that they have really tried their best and they're just helpless. Yeah. So that's so for parents, like it is like we do have to take a step back, but at the same time, you have to be more observant about these little like non-verbal cues yeah, so that you also know when to step in to help them. So I think it's in, in itself, this this whole um, subject that we're talking about is an art, I would say. Art. <laughs> it takes some time to really know. Yeah. Because as a teacher, right, let's say today I just know this kid. I wouldn't be able to tell all these things. You need to like understand, spend some time with the kid, understand their character, and then you'll be able to tell. Hmm. And I guess it's different because when they're in school, they're around their peers. It's, mm -hmm. it's like... Yeah, of course they're gonna learn independently, right? Because they're in school. But then the moment you bring that setting that that um, need to study and learn at home, mm -hmm. and they're around parents and family, that's a very different environment for them to operate in. And all of a sudden, have to like you know study on their own and things like that. Yeah, you also have to differentiate because sometimes like for certain kids, it's they are dependent on their parents because they just. They just like that connection, you see. They want to find an excuse to talk to their parents. Oh yeah, it's possible for them, right? Yeah. So most of the time, when you you ask them whether they they 
is it true that they don't know? Some of the kids will be very adorable. They tell you, I know, actually, I, I know how to do it. I just want to ask. I just want to like, uh, confirm what I'm thinking is correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have cases where they will say like, oh, oh, I just want to confirm, double confirm and triple confirm. <laughs> kids, huh? But, okay, so now that they're going through home-based learning, right, how, how do you, what advice can you give parents for them to, I guess, like, properly benchmark the learning that their children are able to to do, to absorb, like, the, the knowledge they're able to absorb during this time, just to make sure that their children are, like, academically, like, they're able to keep up, right? Because mm-hmm. it's, okay, it's home-based learning, the, it's, it's, it's two months of, you know, staying home and not being in school. This is not a holiday, people, like, you know, you, you still have to do work, you still have your kids still have to like learn and keep up with their academics. How can parents make sure that their children are are actually learning without having to compare them with uh, with other children, like in, in terms of test scores and results? So I think at the end of the day, right, the parent really have to understand the kid's ability and recognize that every child is different. So um, Right now with home-based learning, it's very difficult to gauge. But I think the best way would be to make sure that the kid is putting in consistent effort and then uh, whatever their teachers have asked them to do in school, right? They have completed their own work because this will help in the long run when they eventually get back to school and then they'll be able to like be on, on par with their peers at least. Yeah, so right now, right, I don't think uh, from, from, from the parents' point of view, it's going to be a little bit hard to benchmark their, their kids' learning because like, for teachers in school, we have a lot of data, we can see like, what's the average score, we, know, we, we yeah. roughly know where the kids are. Yeah, so one way maybe if parents will, uh, want, want to benchmark their kid is to make use of like online assessment platform where you have a lot of kids like doing practices together. So you can roughly tell like, um, whether is my kid competent in this area of study yeah so really there are online um, tests like mm. practice tests so that they can identify which areas their children need more help with mm. oh yeah so like uh, actually at practical right we, we are really doing it so what we do is for math we help the kids identify their all, all the different skills that they need to learn in school so we'll measure their competency rate so this would be quite similar to what uh, MOE is doing, the AL achievement levels. Okay. And then on the other hand, right, we also measure their performance uh, with respect to their peers. So the bell curve. Yeah, so I think this gives, not only gives the parents the feedback that they need, the children themselves will r- like roughly know where they stand and what's the room of improvement they have. Huh? Mm. Uh, okay, because there's a lot of comparison in terms of like test scores and things like that. And um, let's admit it, it's necessary so that, you know, you, you know how you're performing and what you need to do in order to improve in certain areas. Like, I, I feel like that's necessary. Mm. But when it comes to children, um, mm. and I feel like some parents may be a bit guilty of this as well. When it comes to children, right, when they look at their scores, there, there seems to be um, like a, a negative effect on children. Mm. When, when they end up like comparing the scores even if it comes from a very factual um comparison and it's not really like in terms of like you, your your value as a person there, there's still that like that impact on a child right that oh I, I'm not doing as good how do you like advise parents to like what advice can you give parents in order to like to avoid that negative impact and just really focus on like the I'm here to help you yeah, okay, so I think you brought a really, very really good point. Because as teachers, right, we also try to uh, communicate this idea to the kids that, you know, kids being kids, right? Like, let's say when we were to give back, like, a, a test paper, perhaps, then everybody will be looking at their score. Okay, so 80 means good, as uh, maybe what, 50 means bad. But then you have to make a conscious effort to explain to the kids. We are not looking at the eventual score, you see? So the score is just a feedback on what you know and then what you don't know. So what you should be paying attention to is actually the mistakes that you are making in the test paper itself so that you know that oh so since i i'm not good in this area the next time what i can improve on i have to learn this area well mm. so similarly for parents right i think parents will also need to put in that uh idea in the kids that what what the va- okay what's the most important thing that parents value at the end of the day right it's really about kids doing their best 
and then putting in the most effort that they can. So because when you at the end of the day, when parents say, "Oh, you you are supposed to score ninety," why? Perhaps the parents know that these kids' ability, right? Their maximum potential is ninety. So when you are scoring fifty, it means that you are not putting in everything that you have got. Yeah. So it's you. You have to place the uh, emphasis on the effort part. Mm. So recognizing, like, um, recognize and encouraging behavior. Mm. It does it play a very important role when it comes to encouraging kids to study like on their own or for independent learning? Uh, okay, I think generally right, we all need encouragement. So kids included, especially young kids. So um, it would be good if parents now that with home based learning you are spending much more time with the kids. Yeah. Whenever you catch them doing something good or something something that you think that they have uh, put in the effort, just be generous with your praises. So when you praise, right, uh, there is a certain art to it. So you don't tell the kid like, oh, I'm very proud of you today because you have done well. Just to the kids, right, they'll be like, uh, yeah, I've done well, but I don't really know what exactly the I have done. I do. Yeah. So you, you, you need to make it explicit to the kids. So you need to tell your kids like, oh, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of you because you have shown an improvement today. Yesterday, you were able to like focus for 10 minutes, but today, you know what? You did 15 minutes, you know, and that's you are, it shows that you're growing, you're improving. So I'm very, very proud of you as a parent. Yeah. So being specific with what you're thanking them yes. for, what you're praising them for is important. Correct. So when the kids know, right, it, to them is a, um, I would say, a good guide for them yeah. to let them know what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. And then when they get praised by their parents, right, kids being kids, they feel appreciated and that feel good factor really help um, encourage them to do even more better the next time and they're gonna want they're gonna continue doing that because of course like it makes them feel good and it, they know that it makes you feel good and you know the kids right. love and, us like they love and, their parents and teachers so they, yeah. they, they do want to like impress they do want to impress their ch- their parents mm. and things like that that's quite quite telling right yeah how do you how for, sorry, go ahead. for the sorry like for the um weaker kids yeah so, for weaker kids, right, it's really a confidence boost because to them, right, uh, they actually have this self-awareness where sometimes they feel a little bit bad about themselves, like I might not be as good as the rest. So if like parents or teachers can recognize these small little things that they are doing and then help to boost their confidence, it really helps their performance overall and the well-being as well. Yeah. Very important, I mean, for, for kids nowadays because it's going to be difficult for them to adjust back to like school and everything. but. Um, an, an important, I think, like another thought that just popped into my head, right? Like, okay, so um, I think by at this point, parents would pretty much know what to do to encourage their kids mm. to to study on their own and things like that. In in the relationship between like parents and teachers, is there like a, I don't know, is there like opportunity there maybe to work together so that they can encourage the the, the student and the child more? Like, is there an opportunity there? Mm. Okay, I'm all about communication. So communication is something that's very important to me. Yeah. I think that um, for parents and teachers, right, especially during this time, you really need to uh, communicate closely. Because like for teachers, they are also learning about the technology, behind, like how, how to implement uh, home-based learning. Yeah. And I think some of them might, might feel a little bit restrictive because in the classroom, you can do a lot of things. You can interact with the kids. You can get a lot of feedback. But then with home-based learning, sometimes you can't really see the process of like how the kids are doing. And then uh, even with online, sometimes if you're teaching online, the interaction might be... The, the chemistry is yes, still right. a bit different. You can't really replace it totally. So... For parents, if let's say um, you get to see your kids doing their work and then you realize that your kids are actually facing some difficulty or they keep asking you about certain things, yeah. try to communicate this to the teachers because I'm sure the teachers have actually uh, left some form of communicate, perhaps through an uh, email or phone or something. Yeah, So it is important to let the teachers know what difficulty your kids are facing so that it will help in their planning when the kids go back or it also helps with their planning with like future lessons, what maybe perhaps the tool that they're use, using is wrong, maybe they can like change to, uh, some, to, to something more interactive. Yeah, so I think teachers really need a lot of feedback right now. And then sometimes uh, parents might not really understand 
why the teachers are doing certain things that they're doing or maybe for parents they think that there are things that the teachers could have done better so in this case right i think it's good that there's communication and sometimes uh, the sharing of knowledge it really helps and for the pet then like overall it will actually benefit the kid as well mm. that's true because so, then yeah. the child that the, the teachers will be able to like maybe make that transition for when mm. they do go back to school smoother but then because the, in order for them to do that in order for teachers to do that then the parents would have to be telling them like or, or just at least keeping them updated but what's going on at home and how the the learning is like you know like developing at home right yeah yeah, yeah. feedback is always important mm. that's true so thank you very much for spending your time with us Aileen i hope you parents um are able to you know like um thrive through this home based learning journey because it has been extended and i understand it's a it's a challenge for everyone right um we're all adjusting to it still despite the fact that we've already been into it like for two weeks um so thank you very much elin do you have any like final words to our parents just words of encouragement for them to like you know <laughs> yeah, okay so thank you so much for having me i'm very happy to be able to share today so to all the uh, parents out there don't be overly stressed in this period of time because you are really not expected to take the roles of the teachers so just take it as a time of learning and bonding with your kids and uh at the end of the day god speak <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much thank you very much now to all POSB parents leave a comment um if you have other questions and do keep a lookout for the infographic we'll be preparing to summarize the topics and like the little tips that we learned in this episode bye bye